This man was strong and he was rich. But there was sadness inside of his heart because as he sat there at this tea time on a spring day, he was sitting inside of his palace but he was getting wet. He was sitting there. It was clean and crisp food that he was eating but the rain was falling down because a giant had ripped the roof from off the top of the palace. He had to sit inside of his own house, inside of the palace, with a hat upon his head. And this hat would keep the rain from off his face, but it would soak into his food. And all he wanted to find and all he wanted was to have a roof at the top of his palace that would be round and blue and pointed. Now the rain kept falling down and he could hear it pitter patter pitter patter pitter patter pitter patter patter and it was pattering down but he could hear music music that seemed to be coming from the sound of the rain so he took his plate and placed his hand on top of it to make sure that the music wasn't coming from his old plate and as he listened the music got louder louder and stronger and he started to walk throughout all of his palace and as he was following the music he found a small round red ball and with each of the drops of rain he was starting to hear a beautiful song some beautiful music and he knew that this ball must be magical and if it was magical then perhaps it could help me this man so strong and so rich but so sad wished that he could have had a boxing glove so he could have fought the giant and stopped him from bullying him. But if he had a magic ball that could sing, then perhaps the magic ball could help him. He crossed his fingers, he crossed his heart three times and said, Oh, I wish, oh, I wish that I could have a roof at the top of my great palace that would be round and red so that when the giant tries to grab at it, his hand will slip away. There was a rushing sound. There was a rattling sound, and there was a great big crash. And no sooner had the words come from out of his mouth than at the top of the palace there was a huge, round, shining roof. The roof was fixed. And the giant, when he saw this, he was angry. I'm going to take the roof from off of your great palace. But when he reached towards it, his hand slipped away from it. He got even angrier and he roared. Rah! But everyone inside of the village looked at the giant who couldn't tear the roof from off the top of the palace. And one started to laugh and another started to laugh and they all started to laugh at the giant and the giant did not like it. He raised his fist. But all of these people who might have been smaller than him, there were many of them and when they all started to run towards the giant, the giant who had never been defied before, jumped up and he ran away from that place. And everyone who ever wanted shelter or something to eat could go inside of the strong man's palace and sit down and be kept dry and warm because the roof kept the rain away. And they would sit and they would eat and they lived happily ever after.
Big Bad Ben B bombed baby beach balls by batting big baseballs. There was once a big called Ben who lived by the side of the beach. He used to bump and bounce in the water. He would bomb people who came close by. But one bonfire night, he could see that there was a big blue and black balloon. It was a birthday for a baby. But this baby was holding on to the balloon. And big bad Ben B, who used to live by the side of the beach, thought that he would bat the balloon out of the baby's hand. Now, he was very good at ba basketball. He was very good at riding on his bike, his brand new bike. But big bad Ben, the beach bee, who used to bomb and bounce around, thought that he would try and put his brains to it and bat the balloon, the black blue balloon, out of the baby's hand and he would use a great big baseball bat. Now, big bad Ben, the beach bee, who would bomb and bounce around, picked up that brown baseball bat picked it up high above him and brought it down on the big black and blue balloon that belonged to the baby and knocked it out of its hands. The baby bawled, the baby screamed. But Big Bad Ben, the bouncing bee that lived by the side of the beach, didn't see the baby's brother. The baby's brother was very angry. He raised his big black boots and brought them down on Big Bad Ben the terrible bee who lived by the beach who used to bounce and bomb and brought an end to Big Bad Ben with a great big bump of his big black boots. You could tell that she was a happy girl because she had a small smiling mouth and wide green eyes. Her eyes were big and there was a smile on her lips and she would pull her thin fingers through her long curly white hair. This girl stood at the edge of the small railings by the side of the big square park. She used to love to come here and she would pull her hands over a new green school jumper. Now, she patted down her pink short skirt, for this girl kept a little teddy bear inside of a thin pocket. She might have had thin arms, but her legs were strong, and she stamped her big black shoes by the side of the big square park, and the brown sloppy mud went all over her legs. There had been some new shiny green swings put inside of the park, but this girl loved to go on the old swings and when she went through the old swings they were rusty and she went past the seesaw and she sat on them and she went up and she went down and she went up and she went down and she went higher and higher and that small teddy bear that she kept in the thin pocket by the side of a pink short skirt fell out of her pocket and sailed through the air and landed in the brown sloppy mud by the side of the short railings. The girl jumped off the swing and landed in the mud with a great splash. Oh, the girl was very pleased with herself because when she looked down at her big black boots they were covered in brown mud. But she could see that there was something by the side of her shoe and she could see that it was a small mirror. She picked it up with her fingers and rubbed it all over her new green clean jumper. Her mum would have been very cross with her if she could have seen what she'd done. She picked up the mirror and looked at it and joked. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who was the fairest of them all? She didn't really expect that the mirror would talk back to her, but she pointed it down towards the little bear. Well, what do you think, bear? But it was then that you could see that the bear had gone. She started to cry. It was a bear that she'd had for a long time. And as she stood there crying, she could see that there was a woman, a young woman, 
who had a walking stick in her hand, and she was walking by the edge of the park, but porking the brown sloppy mud with a walking stick, and she fished something out that looked like a dirty sock. She smiled to herself and shouted to the girl, Is this what you have lost? The girl with the long curly white hair was wondering if it could have been her teddy bear. She ran over, slip, stop, slip, 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 in all of the brown sticky mud, and she could see that a teddy bear was completely covered in mud. The young woman said, It's all right. I'll take the teddy bear and I will wash it for you in the lake in the big square park. She put it in the water. The teddy bear looked very sad and sorry for itself. But she shook it out and wrung it out and gave it back to the girl. And Even though the bear was covered in mud, she still loved that teddy bear just as much as she'd always done. And the woman with a stick in her hand and the girl with the long white curly hair walked hand in hand till they came to the edge of the park and they stopped by the edge of the park where the sign told them to and the two of them became the best of friends and they lived and stayed in that town and they would play in the park but the woman would always say as she rested on a stick you'd better beware and always take care of your beautiful little bear He was a tall boy, and everyone knew him inside of the village. You would see him with his short hair, and he always lived in the old cottage by the side of the long, deep river. Now, he was going to get some clean water from the river, and he took in his hand a crystal clear glass to take some of the crystal clear water. He was thirsty. And in the early morning sun of this winter's morning, he stood there and thought how happy he was. And he took the water, and just as he was about to raise it to his lips, he could see a reflection on the top of the flat, fast flowing river of an alien ship. It looked like a flat blue plate in its reflection, but the exhaust fumes had turned the sun blue. As he stood there, he was frightened and excited at one and the same time, because he had always wanted to meet someone from another planet. But as he stood there and looked, he could see by the edge of the long, fast flowing river that there were crocodiles. The teeth, the teeth were long and sharp, and the mouths were open, gaping like huge sharks. And then he could see the aliens coming out of the ship. They were standing there, but all he could see were the sharks coming closer to them and closer to himself. He didn't wait for a second. He screamed, get out of the way, get away from this place. The crocodiles will get you. All the aliens could see was someone who walked upon two legs, screaming, yelling and shouting at them, an angry, frightened look in his eye. They didn't wait. They just turned around and ran back inside of their ship. As the spaceship took off, the flames were like knives, red, blood-coloured knives that cut through the night. They burned. They burned all of the sticks and the twigs that were down by the muddy bank of that river. No one believed him that he had seen aliens, but their one, two, three toes were pressed under the soft mud, and the fire and flame from that come from out of the alien ship had baked it hard, but still no one believed him. He waited by the side of the river, even when he was married and had children of his own, he would tell them the stories of the aliens that he'd seen by the banks of the river when he had been a boy. But still, no one, not even his own children, believed him. And a slow, soft, salty tear 
rolled down by the side of his cheek and fell into the river as he would stand there and wait for the aliens to return. This man was happy, but he was a robber. He was rich. He'd always stolen things as quickly as he possibly could by reaching out with his long, thin fingers. And now, on holiday, in this city that had a river that ran through it, he was looking, he was walking, looking at all of the great buildings. They were new. They were shining on this summer's afternoon. He looked at the river, the wide river, as it made its way through the middle of the city. But now, the rain was starting to pour. But he didn't mind, for he could feel all of the money inside of his pocket. He bought himself rich clothes to keep himself dry, and he enjoyed the sound of the wind as it blew across the top of the river. But what he didn't know was, from a distance, there was someone who was looking at him through a pair of binoculars, Someone who knew him from the village that he'd come from and knew him to be a robber and a thief. This man, he climbed out of his huge tall tower down a ladder and stood by the robber by the edge of the river. This new man held an ice cream in his hands and ate at it. It is a fine day today, isn't it? A good day. And he ate at the ice cream. The robber looked and he wanted one too, but he couldn't think of a way of just stealing it. And he thought to himself, well, yeah, yes, it is, it is a, a nice day. And as he stared at the ice cream, he didn't notice that the other man had reached inside of his pocket and had scooped out all of his money. He smiled to himself as he waved him goodbye. A good day to you, and I hope that you enjoy yourself. The robber went back to his hotel and he sat there by a candle's flame and smiled to himself to think that he was soon going to be counting out all of his money. He put his hand into his pocket to try and scoop out the money to count it, but there was nothing in that pocket. He reached into his other pocket and there was nothing there. He could not believe it. He felt so angry. He took out a pen and started to write, My dear sir, I am surprised that in your new city by the side of the river you have so many robbers. I, was sto I had all of my money stolen by a thief. A robber and a thief and a robber and a thief and a robber. It was then that he realised that that was the way that he had made all of his money. By being a robber and a thief. He walked out of his room for he couldn't pay for it anymore. And he had to walk on his way home. And he went by the side of a long, thin river. It reminded him that once he'd had a huge, wide river of money, and now he only had a small trickle of money that he had taken and stolen. He stood by this small river. The rubber looked. And what he couldn't see was, in the distance, there was a snake. A snake that was getting ever closer to him. The snake raised itself up. And he was thinking so much of how he'd lost all of his money that he did not see the snake as it came down and bit him. As he closed his eyes, he wondered if he would ever see another day. But he wished that he had never robbed in the first place. He was in his cave, and safe against the winter's cold and the winter's wind. But the fire that was inside of this cave always filled the air with smoke, and sometimes it would choke and cut at his throat. But the shadows would leap and the shadows would reflect against the cold cave walls. But he didn't care, for he had everything that he could possibly want. And there wasn't anything inside uh, of that cave that he hadn't used his fingers to take from someone else. The light would reflect against the piles of gold and silver. But one thing, a large golden plate. Over the top of the large golden plate there climbed a spider. And the flickering flames of that fire reflected 
on the mirror surface of the golden plate and made the spider seem as big as a man's hand. And so it moved as a shadow against the wall. But this man, tall and thin, was frightened. Frightened by the shadows that were cast upon the, upon the wall from the flickering flames of the fire. He was frightened, frightened by the shadow. And he thought that what had happened was, it was a payment. A payment for all of the things that he'd stolen. And now, great and terrible creatures would live amongst all of those things that he'd stolen. He decided that he would collect them all together and place them in a horse and a cart. And he would take them away from that place and perhaps he would be left in peace. But his fingers were light and his fingers were fast. And he always thought that he could take more things. And as he loaded them up onto the horse and to the cart, he started to ride out. But the ground was icy and slippery. And they slipped. They would fall from off the back of the cart. And as he found himself by two great pools that reflected the starlight, he looked into the horse, horse and cart. He looked at the cart and saw that one by one, in the slippery cold, misty night, they had slipped and fallen and left a trail. He didn't want to go back to that place in case there were those great and terrible spiders. He was never seen in that village again. And his cave became derelict and empty. And you would think that that would be an end to the tale, but it wasn't. For a young girl who had no home moved into the cave. But unlike that robber who had used it to store all of the things that he had stolen, she loved spiders, and especially by winter's night. For she would look at the webs and think that they just looked as if they were doused with jewels. Each small particle of ice would look to her like a diamond. And she would sit and she would not light a fire in case it melted those crystals of ice on the spider's webs. And she would sit and smile and pull a scarf about herself and watch and smile and think that she had the finest home and the finest of friends and spiders who would catch diamonds in their webs. This man was rich, but he did not use his money in a good way. And everyone inside of the town knew him as a bad man. For he would take houses that, was, that were in the ancient and ruined village and make people live inside of those. And if they could not pay the rent, then he would come and he would break the doors down. He would smash the windows. But he didn't care. Now he was walking. He was walking far away from the ruined village where he made other people live. And as he was walking, he was thinking and he was not walking in a straight line. And soon he'd meandered, meandered to where there were great tall straight trees. And then amongst all of these trees he wandered. And I've got to tell you, the thunder clouds were forming above him. But still he walked, not in a straight line. And still he walked and thought, and then he noticed that one of the trees was smoother and straighter than all of the rest. And he saw that there was a second and a third and a fourth. And as he looked, he couldn't believe his eyes because above him there was a table. And each of these straight, smooth tree trunks, or so he thought, were the legs of a table. A gigantic table. Now, in the air, there was that smell of animal and dead animals, but above it all, there was a sweet smell of food. And he thought to himself, there must be some good food at the top of this great giant's table, and I wish that I could have it. And he felt a longing inside of his heart that he hadn't felt for a long time. For with all of his money, he never wanted for anything, and could always have whatever he wanted. He wanted to try and climb up to the top of the table, but the legs were smooth, and it was then that he saw that there was a great sheet lying on top of the table. 
perched over one co corner. It held every colour of the rainbow and he tried to climb and he grabbed hold of it. But as he pulled at this great sheet, this huge gigantic tablecloth, it pulled away. He thought that there would be treasure, treasure at the top of this great giant's table. But all he did was pull the cloth down and it fell all over him as if it were a tent. And then he realised that he could want for things. He could need to have things. He could long for things. And he didn't know whether it was a fact that the thunderclouds had become filled with rain and it was now pouring down and it was sheltered underneath that gigantic table. He couldn't tell whether it was rain or a tear that fell down his cheek. For he realised the way that he felt now was the way that he made everyone feel who lived inside of the terrible houses that he forced them to live in. And he would break down the doors and smash the windows. And just for one moment, that tear or that raindrop made him feel cold inside of his heart. And he realised that it is all well and good to have money, but if you do not use it wisely, then it can bring you no pleasure. He wanted to go to the houses. He made sure there were gardens outside of the houses with smooth, flat areas of land that children and families could play upon. He also made sure that there would be sweet and golden music in the air. And now, when he wandered along the road, instead of seeing fear in people's eyes, he was given something by all of those people that he had never been given before. He was given a look, not of terror, not of anger, not of fear or of pity, but a look of friendship. And he realised that with all of his money, he could get something that was better than wealth and fear. He found that his days were filled with happiness and with friendship. And he lived to the end of his days, where once people would curse his name, people spoke his name with kindness and fondness. And he was remembered well. The kind girl lived inside of the new city. She was a good girl and she was out playing with all of her friends. But then, as it was starting to get just a little bit dark, she could hear the sound of the clock. And the clock was striking six o'clock and she knew it was time for her to go home. Now, as she was walking back home, by the side of the trees at the edge of the river, she heard the sound of someone crying. And it was a man, a man who was resting on his axe by the side of the trees. He was crying, I can't lift up this great axe, it's far too heavy for me. And the girl tried, and he tried too, and he could not lift the axe up. The girl didn't know how to help the man, she didn't really know what to say. But by the side of the city there was the soft and silvery sea. And she went and stood by the side of the sea and on the sand. And she had lots of friends. Because every day she would go down to the sea and throw bread for the fishes. She would feed the seagulls. And as she stood by the side of the sea, one of her best friends, an octopus, was there at that place. It spoke to her. You do look very sad. Why are you so sad? The girl told the octopus about the man who thought that the axe was too heavy. And then the octopus started laughing. <laughs> That's the easiest thing in all of the world. And the octopus whispered in her ear just exactly what it was that she had to do. She went back the next day after she'd played with her friends and the clock had struck six. And she found the man crying and resting against his axe. But when she came towards him, she was shaking a tambourine. My friend the octopus has told me what you need to do. The man with the axe looked and said, What I need to do? Is that me playing a tambourine? Oh yeah, said the girl. I'll play the tambourine 
and you will learn to dance with me. And she plays the tambourine and the man raises his arms and stamp his feet and dance around. And then she said, oh, my friend the octopus has also told me that what you need to do is to have some good, strong food. Food that will make you strong in your arms and if it's all right with you. I've asked my mum and my dad if you could come and sit with us and eat some good food. The woodcutter sat down at the girl's mother and father's table and he had some of the best soup he had ever eaten in all of his life. It made him feel fit and strong and tall and after that he could lift up the axe. It was not so long that he loved to dance. And he looked at the girl and gave her a smile that was as big as a banana. This boy was very mean. There was no way that you could try and ignore that fact. If anyone came close to him, he put his hand into a fist. He would kick out with his feet because he did not like to share. Now, one of the things that he liked best of all was to sit by the side of his granddad. And his granddad would tell him stories, all different kinds of stories. He'd make up stories with him inside of it. But there was a school, new and bright and shiny. And since it was a new school, they didn't have that many toys. And so they wrote a letter to the mothers and fathers, to the grandmas and granddads and aunts and uncles, and asked them if they had any old toys that they could put inside of the new shiny school. Lots of bags were brought in, but this boy would sit there and any toys that were brought in, he would place them on top of his head. He would say, it's mine. You can't play with it. It's mine. And he would always sit there. Now, he didn't have very many friends, which wasn't a surprise because he was always so cross and so mean. But he would sit there, and I've got to tell you, he loved to get dressed up, best of all. It was a crown that he loved to wear, and he would put a cloak on his back, and he would sit there and talk and play by himself. But it was thought that it would be a good idea if all of the children in the school could go on a trip. Now the trip was going to be down by the side of the seaside where the sand was soft and yellow and this boy's granddad decided that he would go and help the school by going on the trip with the children. When they got to the side of the silvery sea the boy looked and his granddad was going to tell a story. Good. My granddad always tells stories with me and I'm going to be at the granddad listened. He'd watched his grandson raise his hands and in, put them into fists and watched him how he tried to kick the other children whenever they came close to them. And now he said that he was going to tell his grandson's favourite story. He's going to tell the story about a frog. One of the things that the granddad had brought to the school was an old toy, a soft, cuddly toy in the shape of a frog. It was filled with small pebbles and beans, and the boy had always liked it when his granddad had handed it to him. But the granddad smiled. Once upon a time, there was a frog, and this frog would play in the water by the side of the castle. And the princess, when she saw the frog, she ran away. Um, who can I give this frog to? The grandson was going... It's going to be me. It's going to be me. But the grandfather gave the soft and cuddly green frog to a little girl. The boy realised that he couldn't have a fight in front of his granddad and he looked. But he did like the story. And this girl, she did not like the frog at first. But then they became friends and the frog became a king. The grandson could see his granddad reaching for the crown that he always gave to him. But instead of giving the old crown to his grandson, he gave it 
to a boy. And that boy put it on his head. The grandson looked and went, but you always give it to me. You let me play with your toys. And the, and the grandfather looked and said, no. With toys, it's always a good thing to share. You can't always have them yourself. And these toys were new when I was young. But now they're old but still as good. And they are even better when you share them. The boy listened to what the grandfather said. And his hands that were always put into fists soon turned into hands of friendship. The boy liked playing with the old toys, but not just by himself. He liked to share. The grandfather would smile when he waited to pick him up at the end of the school day. And the boy would talk about how he'd used his grandfather's old toys. And how he had shared them. And knew what it was to hold someone else's hand in friendship. And not raise the hand as a fist. It was this girl's bedtime, and she knew it was her bedtime, and she knew that she should have gone home. But she was standing in the middle of this new city, a big city, and this girl was looking around, quite pleased with herself, for everything that she'd done that day. She was cruel, cruel in the way that she spoke, and she would say things without even thinking about them, just so that she could enjoy the salty taste of the terrible words as they spilled from her lips and her teeth and her tongue. But now, on this spring evening, she knew that it wasn't too hot or too cold, but she must definitely go back home. And as she was walking back towards her own home, what did she see but a house? A house that she'd never seen before. She couldn't believe it. It was neither too hot and neither too cold, but this roof that she could see was covered with ice and she didn't like it and she thought that she would take it upon herself to make sure that she told whoever it was who lived inside that she didn't like it so she knocked upon the door and the door creaked open in the doorway there stood an old man the old man was smiling but he was reading from a book, a small book. Uh, he was reading from the book and looking at the pages and the girl without even thinking about how upset she could make someone with the words that she spoke, she started to say, yours is a horrible house, a terrible house. I don't like your house. I don't like the ice on the top or the way that it looks. And the old man looked up from his book and said, so, you do not like my house. Is that what you're trying to say? No, I don't like it at all, said the girl. She looked at his book. Now his book was green and on the outside of the book there was a picture of a frog. And I think, said the girl, I think that your book is a stupid book if it's all about frogs. I don't like frogs and I really, really don't like you. It just seemed to be one thing after another that spilled from her mouth a soul. And now he looked up from the pages. You do not like my house, because it's horrible. Yes. You do not like my book, because you don't like frogs. Yes. I think that you'd better be careful, said the old man. For those people who shout and scream and yell and bawl can sometimes find themselves turning into that which other people might not like as well. What do you mean, boy? Oh, the girl's voice had gone. She now sounded like the frogs that she didn't like. Oh, said the old man. You don't like my house. You don't like me. He could tell that the girl was trying to talk to him. But he smiled and said, Well, maybe, maybe you should think about saying good things and you can come back here tomorrow and we'll find out 
whether you can improve the things that you say. The girl was frightened. She had a small, soft, salty tear that ran down the side of her cheek. She ran back home and her mother and father were expecting her to say horrible things. But without opening her mouth, in case it sounded like a frog, she ran upstairs and went to bed. The next morning at breakfast time, her parents were expecting her to do what she always did. That was to shout and scream and yell and bawl. But the girl said nothing. When she was in the play yard and all of the other children were playing around, when she didn't say anything horrible to them, they pulled her into their games. But the girl still said nothing in case her voice sounded like a frog. That night, at the same time, at bedtime, she'd had a busy day but she hadn't said anything. She'd had a busy day and she went to the door and she knocked upon the door and the old man stood there and smiled. So, do you have something to say to me? The girl's throat was dry. She was frightened. There was a salty taste in her mouth. She didn't want to say anything terrible in case it became worse than it already was. Sorry! Now that didn't hurt now, did it? said the old man. Perhaps you should be careful what you say and what you shout. And remember, if you have the idea that you can say your terrible things again, you will know by the way that your throat feels that you will start to sound like a frog again. The girl made sure that she wouldn't say anything terrible, awful, horrible or nasty. And she grew into an old woman. And she always made sure that she said good things to people. And if she would stand and see children playing, and if there was anyone, be it a boy or a girl, who would say anything terrible, she would rest upon a walking stick and whisper in their ears, You'd better be careful for those people who say horrible things. Their voice might turn into a croak of a frog.